May I have the attorney please? Mrs. Bealy? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Dr. Miles? Here. Mr. Murphy? Here. Mr. Perry? Here. Mrs. Hobbs? Here. Ms. Hartle? Here. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are um, a couple of adjustments. The um, appointments for um, 6.4, which is 6.4, 6.4.1, 6 and 6.4.2, um, were uh, mislabeled, and so we've corrected that, and while we were cleaning it up, um, we added uh, a high approval of a, a high school foreign language teacher, a Spanish teacher. Um, so uh, that's one adjustment. The second adjustment to the agenda is then moving to adding a 6.5, and that will be in a, a motion to approve the maintenance labor contract that was uh, solidified. The board had been apprised of the, the details of that in an earlier executive session. Um, that contract is to be in effect July 1 through July of this year, uh, through uh, June 30th of 2019. Very good. 5.0 is a recognition, and I'm just going to go over to the microphone here and invite Emma to join me. So oh, it's my pleasure this evening to talk to you for a minute about Emma Hartle, who has just graduated already from Scarborough High School. Mm -hmm. Emma is the daughter of Bill and Sharon Hartle, who are here the evening. They, they live on Black Point Road. Emma has accomplished many things during her four years at Scarborough High School. She has been an outstanding student academically. She maintained a GPA of over 96 when weighted. She is projected to graduate within the top 10% of her class, and in fact, she did. <laughs> she is a member of the National Honor Society and has participated in 10 hours of in-school service and 10 hours of community service. Emma was a Hobie ambassador and attended the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership Conference where she continued to improve her leadership skills along with other statewide student representatives. Emma has been on the school board for the past two years. She represented fellow classmates and friends and contributed to important discussions and was a voting student member of the school board. As such, she advocated for the one-to-one -one technology at the high school. She also was a presenter at the Maine School Management Fall Conference in 2014 in Augusta, talking to statewide board members about the importance of having students on the school board. She organized the selection of a junior at the high school to join the board, who we currently have joining us for this next year as well. She t participated in numerous high school activities, including the most recent undertaking to gather student input on the high school schedule. Emma has been on, uh, fortunate to be an honorary page in the state senate and has traveled to France with our high school French class. In her free time, <laughs> she has been involved with the Scarborough Dance Center competition team. She has been an active member at St. Max as a youth ministry member. She is a member of the Key Club and the Interact Club, participating in six club-sponsored ser service opportunities, including Partners for World Health, meal preparation at Ronald McDonald House, and collecting donations for the Salvation Army at Christmas time, to name a few. Emma has been employed during high school at Big Licks Ice Cream and also as a dance instructor at Scarborough Dance Center. Emma received a very high dis distinction this year when she was selected recently for the Maine Principals Award for 2016. She will be attending Loyola in Chicago this fall. 
Her motto is, I like adventures and I'm going to find some. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear about them anyway. Christine needs to talk to you about Chicago. Call me directly. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you. Good luck. Have a good night. Good luck. <laughs> Have a good summer, huh? Thank you. Congratulations. At this point in time, if there's anyone in the public who wishes to. Uh, Address the board on any item that is on the agenda. Please come to the microphone, state your name and address, and let us know what you have to say. Seeing no one, we will move on to our new business. 6.1, the meeting minutes of May 5th, 2016. Is there a motion? Well, approval is printed. Second. Very good, any discussion? Very good. All in favor? Seven? No, no, you know, no I wasn't here. I was okay. still sick. So it's one, two, three, four, five. I was Very good. Five. Six point <coughs> two, the meeting minutes of May nineteenth, twenty nineteen. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? Any corrections you see? All in favor? Now we've got seven. Very good. <coughs> Six point three is the second reading of policy JB, the transgender students policy. And uh, you should have in your packet a um, the transgender policy that we discussed last time we met two weeks ago. We did the first reading. Um, basically the policy committee met um, several weeks ago and uh, took a look at a number of documents that we shared with you last time we met, both from MSMA, Drummond Woodson, a variety of pieces of information, sat down and took a look at you know, the, whether it made sense, whether it was appropriate for our district to take a look at the guidelines that our district already had in place and whether or not we want to make that a policy. So that's where we're at on this. Is there? Well, I, just to have a motion on the table, mm -hmm. I move approval as presented. Second. And I just want to say one more thing about this. Um, that there's been a lot of discussion about restroom usage of students that are transgender and how to handle that. But this policy covers a lot more than just restrooms. It's dress code, it's um, names and pronouns, it's official records. It's much more expansive than just restrooms. And that's what's been in the media. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that it doesn't, it's not just a, about that, although it is covered. Um, and there are no changes from the first reading, so. Are there any comments, any questions? <laughs> yes, Jackie. I have a couple of things. In 1959 60, I was an instructor in physical education at Bates College. And as such, I attended a national conference for college physical education teachers in Albany, New York at the university. One of the guest speakers was the head of the theology department at Syracuse University and I don't recall his name unfortunately. But he started his speech this way and the auditorium was packed. He said when a child is born, when that doctor or nurse holds that newborn child and shows that person to the parents, they immediately form opinions on what that child is going to be based on its sex. And if it's a little girl, they picture a dancer in pink 
and they, somebody who may paint or somebody who is dainty. And if it's a male, then they picture somebody who's going to swing a bat or carry a football, be muscular and manly. He said we have these conceptions at the instant of birth and it doesn't always hold true. He said, and you women have played sports and have coached sports and have taught sports. It hasn't changed your gender. It has changed the conception that your parents or others had perhaps when you were born. With a transgender person, it's difficult for the person who is born as they start to age to identify with the sex that they have been appointed. And there's been a lot in the media lately and a lot written, but one of the things that has stood out to me is this. And it was an article written by Mark Eaves, who is <coughs> Speaker of the House of Maine Representatives, and I want to quote, 41% of transgender people attempt suicide. Choosing to leave this world rather than face another day in its hatred. I don't want any student in our school district to have to face that instead of living. We have a responsibility, a responsibility to accept all of our children in our schools, no matter what they profess as their gender, no matter how they were designated at birth. I will always fight for our children, and this is only one way in which we can make everyone equal. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I can't possibly top what Jackie just said, and I want to thank you for those comments. They were passionate and heartfelt and incredibly right-headed, and, and I really appreciate them. Thank and you. I just want to say again, you know, I think that uh, I am so proud to be able to do this. I think, you know, as a school board, it's it's not a daily occurrence that we get to do something where we feel like we're making a really big difference and doing the right thing and we can sort of pound our fists and say that, but this is. It's building on best practices and guidelines that we've had in place for some time. It's building on federal mandates. And I think most importantly, it's building on an ethic of care. And it's saying that, that we value the experience of all of our students. And I am just so incredibly proud and honored and humbled to be a part of, of this policy and just really delighted to be able to endorse it. Mm -hmm. Lizzie? Um, I would just like to say um, I have quite a few friends who are actually transgender who I have met in my two years of being at Scarborough and I think this is possibly one of the most important things that we could do for them because I know a lot of them have felt like they've kind of been overlooked and it's, you know, we can help people who are gay or who identify as bisexual or, but not for this. And I got, I actually got a message from one of my friends after there was an article and she was like, have you seen this? I was like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I have. She's like, this is the most fantastic thing that has happened ever. And so I think having this kind of concrete, like, <coughs> you are going to be helped no matter what, because it's kind of showing how much we do care for the students of Scarborough. And so I just want to thank everyone who worked on that for making it so that my friends, personally, uh, feel more comfortable at our school and kind of feel like they're all set now. So. Well, Scott, thank you so much for those tonight. comments. <laughs> I know. Anyone else <laughs> have any comments for things you want to say? Very good.
Alan's favorite stuff. Seven plus one. Six point four appointments. <coughs> These are, um, as you've received, I'll go through them very quickly. Uh, 6.4.1 is a middle school grade 7 science teacher. This is Maura LaFond. She's uh, been nominated to fill this position. Uh, the position was, um, uh, this opportunity was created by a resignation. Ms. LaFond received her bachelor's degree from the University of Maine, is completing her master's degree in education from the University of Southern Maine. She has been a Spanish and French teacher in both Westbrook, um, in, I'm sorry, Wentworth School and uh, the middle school, but most recently has been the long-term substitute for grade seven science um, since November of 2015. Uh, the recommendation is to appoint Maura LaFond as the middle school grade seven science teacher. Move approval. Second. She's also from Scarborough. And she had, she had actually been with us uh, as a long-term, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that, I have, I'm confusing. Okay, from Scarborough, yeah. Yeah, from Scarborough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Seven plus one, thank you. 6.4.2 is um, a motion to approve my appointment of Joanne Sizemore, representative, and mm -hmm. Allison Marchese, alternate, to the Cumberland County B Region Support System, and that's part of the Administrator Recertification and Renewal um, Committee. Um, the recommendation is to approve that um, recommended appointment. Move approval. Second. Any comments, questions? All in favor? Seven plus one. So that's a three year appointment. Very right, good. 6.5. 6.4.3 is the, is the, uh, <laughs> 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 I'm trying to skip over things. 6.4.3, high school foreign language teacher uh, for Spanish. This is uh, Brooke Wasden, who has been nominated to fill this position. It's been created by a resignation. Ms. Wasden received her bachelor's degree in Spanish from Baylor University, spent eight years as a Spanish teacher in Arlington, Texas. She's taught Spanish and Latin for the fa past five years in the Westbrook schools. And um, Brooke is the individual who had actually been a long-term substitute um, at the high school, loved it, and was dying to come back. And um, so we're uh, asking you to approve her returning uh, as a foreign language teacher in Spanish at the high school. So moved. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Seven plus one. <coughs> Yeah, 6.5? <laughs> right. Uh, 6.5 um, is a motion to approve the agreement between the Scarborough Board of Education and the Scarborough Maintenance Workers. Uh, this is for a three-year period. Um, it's July 1st of this year through June 30th of 2019. The reason we had an adjustment to the agenda this evening is that we finalized the contract this morning and we're not going to be meeting for another what, three weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. So since we had an agreement, we decided that we would sign the draft and bring it forward for your approval this evening so that it could in fact start July 1. Uh, there was not, uh, the, the, the three men were amenable to almost anything, asked a lot of questions, and uh, seemed quite happy with their jobs, quite frankly. Uh, one of the things that we amended in the contract uh, at their suggestion was the fact that a new employee can start to draw their one week's vacation <coughs> after six months instead of having to wait a year from their date of hire. Uh, we took the uh, salary range from 10 steps, I think, and elongated it to 20. So that their two year spaces in the first four years and then one year space after that. And uh, we made the insurance 
coincide with all the other insurance language that we have in all of the other contracts. And beyond that, I don't believe that there were any other changes. But it was a pleasure to, we met, twice. they were willing to sign last time, the first time we met, and we said no. But wait till we take all of these suggestions and put them into a draft, and then we'll meet again. So I move that we approve this contract. Second. Any discussion? Any questions? I just want to thank you all for negotiating on our behalf and doing such a great job. I'm sure it's a thankless. Oh, this one is back. This one is back. Very good. All in favor? Seven plus one. And 7.0, our workshop. 7.1, long range facilities planning. Final report. I would um, <coughs> turn it over to the chair of the long range facilities planning team, Christina. Thank you. Um, so, this has been going on for quite a while. Um, we had um, Mr. Cecil, Dan Cecil from Harriman Associates here oh, more than a year ago. And um, he presented to the board at the time, there were a couple of uh, previous members here, but he presented to us some options for our school buildings and potential things that we could do if we needed to shift things or change things depending on our enrollment trends. Um, so then we put Dan on the back burner and we brought planning decisions in and planning decisions um, did a comprehensive uh, study in conjunction with uh, Dan Bacon down in the town planning office um, as to looking at um, housing starts, they checked uh, birth rates and things like that. So um, we met with Dan Cecil again from Harriman and asked him to kind of wrap it all into one big bundle. Mm. So um, right now there's an executive summary coming around that he's written and I will turn it over <coughs> to you. Thank you for coming out tonight. We oh, my, my it. pleasure. Yeah, it, it, it was a very emotional night <laughs> so far. <laughs> and this will be a little bit drier. <laughs> Yeah, it's riveting to talk. Yeah. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is the executive summary, which is basically the key findings of the Long Range uh, Facilities Plan Committee. Uh, there's another piece of the work that's going to be done this summer with uh, Todd and myself, but uh, let's go through this and uh, in fact, why don't you raise your hands if you have a question as we go through it. I'll try to do this relatively quickly, but uh, you don't have to wait till the end. So executive summary, long range facility plan goals. I mean, basically what you're trying to do big picture is to align your educational programs with the state of your facilities and to make sure that your facilities serve those programs as well as they can. On top of that, we were charged with seeing if there were ways that, that you could reduce your operating costs on your facilities uh, and, and still provide uh, good facilities for education uh, in order to you know, lower your overall costs and you know, that, that money can always be used in, in other places. So we, we looked at that quite uh, extensively. So I, I won't read through these goals, <clears throat> but I think that they'll all be familiar to you. If you turn to the second page of the handout, student population projections. This turned out to be a pretty interesting uh, thing uh, for, for all of us, I think, on the committee. The last study that you did, projections that you did, were in 2010 and 11, and in January of this year, you got an updated report from planning decisions, uh, which, which showed some interesting things. The big difference between the last time and this time is that uh, earlier, planning decisions had, had done a study uh, basing their projections are what they call best fit, which has to do with live births primarily. Other, there are some other demographic factors in there, but it has primarily to do with live births and then tracing how many of those kids actually go from kindergarten to first grade to second grade and, and adjusting the projections going out 10 years uh, because of that. This time, because of all the growth in the community, uh, what uh, planning decisions was, was required to do was to meet with Dan Bacon, as Christine said, uh, your city planner, and to look at housing starts and try to uh, factor in what the effect of single bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom units, houses, apartments might be on your, on your uh, student population because people move into Scarborough all the time 
and it, it was felt that some some way was needed to try to capture that uh, in migration of, of folks instead of just basing it on, on live births. So you have two sets of numbers now, which again are very, very interesting. The, the 2010-11 study uh, and the 2016 study show that in, in the year 2021, you're basically at, at about the same number that was, that was projected before. You're at about 2,700 and, and some change in terms of the total number of kids in your school district. However, if you uh, factor in the, uh, what they call new housing impact trends, you add another couple hundred students, actually a little bit more than that, to that number. So it's a pretty powerful uh, thing to look at, uh, these housing starts, because it can, can really affect your, your overall population in the, in the school. And, and there, were, there were sort of two trends that were noticed that were interesting. One was that uh, today you have about 3,017 students in the district. Ten years from now, according to these projections, you'd have 3,121 students, and that's, that's uh, you know, 100 students more, which over 10 years is, is very, very small, so that's a very modest increase. However, the anomaly that showed up, or the interesting piece that showed up, was that in the, in the primary grades, K through two, you have a, a big bulge projected to be coming through your school system. Uh, the, the population is actually going to decline for a couple of years, but starting in 2017-18, it's going to uh, rise pretty dramatically so that between now and 2025-26 when the, when the projections end, your uh, population K2 is going to rise by about 25 percent, yeah. which is a lot of kids. Yeah. That's a huge thing. That, that, back in 2010, if that number had, had popped up at that time, it would have definitely changed the calculus and the discussions among the members of the committee about what to do about the primary schools. So the table at the bottom of that second page shows you uh, what's being projected. So in the K-2 schools, 150 uh, additional kids. Uh, at Wentworth, 100, 104 additional kids. And then minor reductions in the middle school and, and pretty good reductions in the, uh, the high school for a net gain of, of about 104 students. So this is important because one of the things, is, as I said, we were asked to do was to look at ways that um, could reduce your overall operating costs and, and, and improve efficiency. So one of the obvious things uh, to do, if you turn to the next page, page three, would be to look at um, operations and maintenance costs, uh, look at the potential of consolidation. Uh, we did a, a study where we went in and we, we measured and inventoried every single teaching space in the entire school district we used a, a formula that the Council of Educational Facility Planners uses to calculate the capacity of your schools. So in, 3, 000, in, in, uh, in 2025, you're projected to have 3,121 students, but your capacity is roughly 3,500 and maybe, maybe some additional students. So you'll have about 400 students more capacity at that time, uh, even with that bump that's moving through the, uh, the, the primary schools. But that's only 11.5%. That's not a big, big number to have as a cushion, especially in, in, a, in a city like this that is so well situated in southern Maine and has so many amenities and still has both uh, housing stock to buy and housing stock that's being uh, built uh, in it. So uh, that 400 students is a good number, but, but it's not a huge number. Um, for operations and maintenance costs, we got a uh, huge amount of data from Kate Bolton and from uh, uh, Todd Jepson on the uh, annual operating costs. And we looked at everything. We looked at oil and gas and uh, snow plowing and trash removal and supplies and teacher salaries and benefits and everything so that we could look at the actual cost uh, school by school of what it takes to operate those buildings. And that's in the, the, uh, the first three chapters of, of, the, uh, of the study that we handed out before. And we found some interesting things as a result of that. We found, first of all, that the primary schools were significantly more costly to operate uh, than the other schools. And uh, we, we scratched our heads at first and said, well, why dollars per square foot is, is such a dramatic difference than the other ones? The study shows that uh, the reason that the primary schools are more costly is there's less insulation in many places than current in, industry standard. One example is Blue Point has 
a bunch of masonry exterior walls with no insulation in them. So their R value, which is a measure of their insulation uh, quality, the bigger the number, the, the better the insulation. Their R value for those walls is R3, but the code says it should be R20.5. So you have you have a lot of you know like like most school districts in Maine you have a lot of uh, old buildings uh, that are not uh, well insulated uh, that could be uh, better insulated the building envelopes in a number of places uh, there there was one time when we were at eight corners I think it was and we were in the back in the classroom wing and we popped the ceiling tile looked up and we could see daylight up above mm -hmm. because of the way that the the uh, ventilation system works in that school so um, air that can go up can also come down in the winter time and make those those uh, rooms colder and, and more expensive to, uh, to heat. Um, there are uh, mechanical upgrades that could be done to the primary schools. They've, they've served you very, very well, but they're all uh, uh, seeing their age at this point. So if at some point in the future, uh, if you were willing to invest in some mechanical upgrades, I think you'd see some, some uh, dramatic uh, improvement in efficiencies. And then last but not least, they're just small schools. Now, the, the, the town of, of Scarborough really loves their small neighborhood schools, and that's a great thing, and I, and, and I, I certainly understand that. But uh, the size of your schools, ranging from 175 students to 227, is really, really small. Um, in a, in a, a, a sort of a perfect world from just an operations and maintenance standpoint, schools that are more in the four to 600 student range are just more efficient dollars per square foot, dollars per student, square feet per student, you know, all the metrics that we used uh, in the original report to, uh, to measure them. Uh, but, so at the time, there was a discussion, well, you know, maybe we should look at consolidating or the potential of consolidating the primary schools. And I think, uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, we were pretty glad that it had not, <laughs> that had not happened, given, uh, given this bulge that uh, appears to be coming at you. Uh, for the Wentworth School, since it just opened two years ago, what I'll do this summer is I'll get back in touch with Kate and I'll get all your operations costs for Wentworth so we can see how that building is performing as part of the original referendum we had to make projections about the uh, operating costs, the energy costs. So now we'll get a chance after two years to, to uh, really see how well that's performing uh, compared to the uh, original projections. The middle school uh, is a little bit of an anomaly. It has higher electrical costs, uh, significantly higher electrical costs than the other schools and that's because you have air conditioning in that building, and it's an old technology, a cooling tower with lots of uh, heat pumps scattered all over the building, which chew up a lot, of, uh, a lot of electricity. So at some point in the future, if you were going to do a major renovation of that building, it would be a good time, uh, especially given its age, I mean, it's 20 years old now, to, uh, uh, to, to look at upgrading that. And then the, the high school was renovated in, in 2005, and its, it's uh, uh, operation costs are, are pretty, pretty good. There is a table in the main study that looks at the building envelopes of all of these schools to, to show you how well they compare to current energy codes, so that's something you can, you can look at. Um, comparison of existing educational spaces to DOE standards. So again, we ran two parallel paths. One was a technical facilities inventory going in with a team of architects, engineers, mechanical and electrical, uh, looking at all the systems um, and then coming back to the office and, and having uh, discussions about what, how, how well they were performing now, whether they should be replaced, what kinds of maintenance should be done on them, those kinds of things. Parallel to that, we did an educational inventory. As I said, we, we went and measured all the rooms. We talked to all the administrators. We talked to a lot of teachers. Uh, we looked at how well those spaces were performing as, a, uh, as compared to what you need for your programs. And then we also put together a table that compared them to the Department of Ed standards. And the Department of Ed standards for room sizes are, are pretty conservative, so uh, they're, not, they're not generous, I'll, I'll put it that way. So we looked where there were places where schools were significantly under that standard. We noted it in the, in the table and in the, and in the report. And again, that could serve as a guide in the future if you were to upgrade uh, or do renovations to the primary schools or the middle school, that's a good checklist to start up, uh, about where you might want to do things to improve the educational uh, spaces. So, so then looking at the primary schools in general, um, again, looking for cost savings was part of the, the mandate and something that the committee worked very, very hard on. 
all of the, almost all of the options for consolidating the um, primary schools involve a construction, some involving some significant construction. <coughs> because if you, if you take Pleasant Hill offline, which has about 175 students this year, then you've got to put those kids in other, in other places. And so that meant additional classrooms in those other places. And it also meant that we were, we were looking at the possibility of removing the sort of quasi-permanent classroom spaces that were built a number of years ago that they have they have foundations under them so they're not like a regular modular but we we thought that maybe you could get some additional uh, energy efficiencies if you replace them at some point uh, but but what happens then is you have uh, a fair amount of, of construction costs for all of those all of those particular options and it was it was clear over time in discussions with the community uh, that, that probably this was not a good time to, to go out for a bond for another construction project for schools. Since you just finished Wentworth two years ago, I understand the town is looking at a public services building potentially, maybe addition to the library, so uh, there's a lot going on in the town. So when the committee reviewed the seven options for uh, consolidating and upgrading the uh, primary schools, there are really only two uh, that, they, that they thought were worth considering moving forward. Uh, and that's one of them is option four down at the bottom of, uh, of page uh, four. And that would keep all three of the primary schools open, but it would um, develop a budget to upgrade those buildings, uh, improving the energy efficiency, uh, helping lower your operations and maintenance costs, maybe doing some um, program upgrades, program space upgrades. Uh, in, in, in particular, in the primary schools, the core spaces, libraries, mm -hmm. your, your combination gym, cafeteria, kitchen spaces like that are, are very, very undersized. And if you talk to the principals, they, they, they would, you know, it, it sometimes is an issue in terms of managing the building uh, for their students. So we would look at all those things based on the data uh, uh, derived in the study, and then you could decide what you might want to uh, want to do. Option six would close Pleasant Hill and then move all the second graders in the district to the Wentworth School because the Wentworth School has some additional capacity. It has roughly 150, you could probably put a couple hundred students in there before you felt like you're really bursting at the seams. And one of the reasons you can do that is not only the classroom space, but it has really good core spaces. Full-size gymnasium, big cafeteria, big library, uh, STEM spaces, that, that kind of thing. So you could, you could incorporate additional uh, uh, kids uh, relatively easily, and in that option, you're not building anything. You're basically moving kids to, to an existing facility that has recently been built. The, the problem with that was um, that it would uh, have some um, issues with uh, programming for those, for those kids there were there were uh, discussions about grade configuration, all kinds of uh, all kinds of options for them, um, but it is a possibility. It would pretty much fill up Wentworth, so that's something that you'd have to consider whether or not you're ready to do that. And and the other the other piece of it is then what do you do with Pleasant Hill? You could give it Pleasant Hill back to the the, the town, and then they would use it for whatever they use it for. Uh, one option was to look at Pleasant Hill as a, uh, a pre-K center uh, in, the, in the school district. So that's something you can do. But given now uh, both the sort of um, resistance to construction right now and this population bulb moving through, it doesn't make sense to let go of that property for the school district because once you let go of that, it's, it's gone forever and there's no, there's no uh, replacing that property. So in the, in the drive to consolidate to save money, I think strategically the building committee finally came to the point where they said, you know, we really ought to hold on to that, not make any decisions about consolidation, maybe for a couple of years, so we watch and see if this uh, uh, increase in population really happens, or maybe it happens even more than what was, was projected, but you don't have to do anything now. Uh, and, and not doing anything now uh, positions you well for whatever may come uh, in in the future. Um, yes. Quick question. Yes. Um, so you, you said that Wentworth can fit a couple hundred uh, more students, but what happens with like right now the secondary class is 219 students, but when that bulge comes through, I feel like it's going to be very tight. 
Yeah, that 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 uh, that was pre bulge. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's you know 219 or 220 students at Wentworth additional, especially uh, that grade uh, level, it's probably not a problem. One of the things that the administrators uh, were working on is it's one thing to put kids in classrooms, but then you have all these other programs that you need to accommodate. So you have right now you have two art rooms and two teachers. They, they can only teach a certain number of sections right. every week. If there's a finite number. Uh, and I think uh, in, in looking at how that might work in the building, it, it became clear that on some of those kinds of programs, it, you might be uh, pinched. So maybe you might end up with, instead of two art teachers, two and a quarter or two and a half or something like that. You'd have to do the same analysis for, uh, for phys ed. Uh, you'd have to figure out how you're going to schedule um, uh, lunch for all those kids. You have a nice big cafeteria. It's not so much space, <coughs> but if you start having, you know, five lunch periods during the day, then that's a scheduling nightmare for the administrators because, you know, I mean, the, kids, the kids have enough time to walk in the cafeteria and they have to turn around and go back to class because uh, you, have, you, know, you have a start time and an end time and you've got to pack a lot of things in between. So, Ms. Kelly. Um, so, a question I have. Um, not as intimately aware as the floor plan, but pretty close as you are with the Wentworth plan. <laughs> I'd say you, you know it pretty, pretty well. Pretty close, pretty yeah. close. But to fit that many kids in there, we're not talking about classroom spaces that are currently empty at Wentworth. Am I correct? This would be like taking the community services area and where the seniors have been gathering and it would take that extra room that's down behind the gym. I mean, it would be like every nook and cranny we would reappropriate to be a classroom. Yes, and, and the other thing that would probably happen, and, and in fact there's a drawing in the report uh, that I gave you last year mm -hmm. that, that models what that might look like. So those gathering spaces that are in wings would then be closed in for a classroom. I but mean, one, of, one of the things you probably end up doing is you probably uh, end up increasing your student per classroom ratio. Right. And you have, you have a really nice set of ratios that govern your decisions about, uh, you know, students and teachers and all of that right now, and that's a that's a nice thing to hang on to, but you would certainly be um, pushing the envelope on on that in the building. But you know, you could do it. I mean, if you were if if the population projection said that in the next five years you're going to lose 600 students, then you would look at something like that because by the time you move those kids in, the population is going to continue to drop at all levels, and so it, in the end, you would end up not being as crowded as it might be uh, today. So that's the other variable, is to think about the variable of time and what the, what the pattern is for those I just want to be very clear that people didn't think that there was all kinds of vacant space no. out in the existing no. building right now, that it is used appropriately right now. Right, right, absolutely. Any, any other questions about the primary schools? I'm, I'm moving through this pretty quickly, but we can come back to any of these. So again, Wentworth was open in uh, 2014. It, its official capacity is 800 students, but again, you can put more students in there uh, if you're willing to, to pack them a little tighter. And because you have uh, play fields and a big playground and you have lots <coughs> of parking and you have big core spaces, you can, you can, um, uh, you know, you could do that if you needed to in, in an emergency. Um, and, and again, this summer, what, what we'll do is I'll, I'll do the same operations and maintenance spreadsheets that we did for the other schools for Wentworth, and then we'll compare it to our projections, and then we can load it in, and then that gives us a benchmark to look at every year about how well or, or, or how efficient or inefficient your buildings are, are operating. Uh, the middle school <coughs> is, a, is, a, is a significant issue. It, it's funny, if you look at the formula that's used by uh, the Council of Educational Facility Planners to calculate capacity just looks at the size of the classroom and how many students should fit in that classroom based on a square foot per student number. And using that metric only, you would say that the middle school is, is way undercrowded, but it's not. And the reason is, is the, the, the design of the building uh, and the size of the core spaces are really uh, making it hard to serve the number of kids that are in there now. And the more kids you put in there, the, the, the more difficult it's going to, to be. So for example, uh, the cafeteria is only 63% of the, of the DOE recommended size, and that's right now. You know, if population increases, that just gets worse and worse and worse. And as you all know, the, uh, the kitchen and the serving area are very small, so you have kids stacking up 
in the uh, STEM music hallway uh, for, you know, almost to the next town uh, during lunchtime because, again, they have very little time and they've got to, they've got to move kids really quickly, but they don't have the infrastructure to, uh, to do that. Uh, the library is 850 square feet smaller uh, than what the DOE says. You have four choke points in the building, which if you've ever been there when classes are changing is, is really astounding. Uh, and it's a place where the hallways narrow down and you have concentrations of kids coming in two directions and trying to pass each other at, that point, at those four points. And it's really difficult. So numerically you can say that the capacity is you know, above 800, but in terms of the functional operation of it, it's well below that. So uh, at, at some point, if, if your population at Wentworth, I mean at the, at the middle school grew, you really would want to try to, uh, to uh, address those. And we'll talk about that in a, in, in a second. I just want to, if I can just jump you in real quick. I, I've spent uh, several full days in the middle school. And um, as someone who, you know, gets a certain amount of PTSD when I think about the middle school experience, um, <laughs> it's terrifying yeah. in yeah. there. It's terrifying yeah. in the modulars because they're, yeah. you know, made out of paper. And to walk those halls with, with, with middle school adolescent kids who yeah. are, like, having all kinds of adolescent stuff going on anyway. Yeah. I mean, I was really intimidated walking yeah. those halls as yeah. a you know as an adult and uh, it's uh, to me it just seems like it's beyond I mean it's beyond beyond capacity yeah. in so many it ways is. particularly given where they are cognitively and emotionally hormonally and everything else like yeah. that so um, I just thank you for that yeah that, that's, that's exactly the case and also a lot of them are really big really big <laughs> I mean they look, they look like you know but they don't know uh, what to do with their bodies yeah, yet exactly. so it's even worse kind of exactly. than a big high school kid because yeah. they don't have the coordination yet and, and, and as I'm sure all of you know that since Passamaquoddy is it has 12 classrooms so that's a lot of kids and it's separated from the main building so the kids are leaving the security of the building that they've already come into they're walking out in the open they have to, to, to get buzzed in to the Passamaquoddy and be out again so not having them connected especially for this age group is not Great. I mean, you're doing it, and it's and it's working. But in a perfect world, uh, you would you would want to take all that space and connect it to the existing building. And that's what the drawings from the last round of the study show is uh, a couple of ideas for uh, new wings that would basically mirror the, the wings that you have already, which in many ways are very nice with that that uh, center hallway that displays out towards the end and the, the gathering space that that creates. I mean, that's a really nice feature and it's something that, that popped up miraculously at Wentworth. Right. Who, would, yeah. who would think? And uh, when, I, when I've given tours of Wentworth, when they go over and see that, that wider hallway space, they just, you know, the teachers go nuts. They really think it's great for all kinds of, uh, of reasons. Small group, breakout space, a place inside that's safe that the kids can burn off some energy, all that, all that kind of stuff. So, so a lot of things about the design are good, but um, the, the way that it's laid out and the fact that Passamaquoddy is, is separate is, is, is a big issue. Um, well, if I could just say one more thing. You bet. My understanding is that there is no place in that school where all of the students can gather. If, right. for instance, they need to have an assembly, they walk right. to Wentworth. Right. Correct? Yes. Okay. That's, isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yes. That is correct. I mean, you have a nice gym there, but again, it's one of those things. You think, oh, wow, you have a, you have a gym there and it has a track around the top. What a nice feature, but it's too small. And the way the track was built, it cuts off uh, shooting lines for basketball. You know, you can find yourself doing a jump shot and hitting the top of the, uh, or having your ball hit the top of the, of the track. So, again, there's, there are a lot of nice ideas in the building that, that would really be great if it just grew a little bit and, and, uh, and got better. So, um, again, we, we, we looked at a couple of ways of improving it. Uh, you have, you know, incredibly small administrative offices. You have no conference space in the building. You have really small uh, interior rooms for special ed. I mean, just a whole litany of, of, of things that could easily be renovated as part of a bigger project, perhaps at some point uh, in the future. Um, in terms of population, you have 744 kids now. These latest projections, again, I'm using the, uh, the new housing impact, the, the larger numbers for all of these, says that that's going to go down in the year 2018-19 to somewhere between 640 and 669 students, depending on which model you use. But then by 2025, it's going to be back where it is now. It's going to be at 736. So 
the, the decline over the next three to five years will help, uh, but the intrinsic problems won't get corrected uh, completely, at least by uh, reductions in population. And then in 10 years, or a little bit before that, you'll actually be pretty much the same place where you are uh, right now. So something, something to consider if, if uh, at some point uh, the middle school rises to, to a, a potential project. Um, the high school was, as you know, was renovated extensively in 2005, and so it continues to function uh, well. I, I know that uh, Todd has occasional minor capital improvement projects there just to adjust pieces in the building for, you know, this office and that office and, and small functions, but overall uh, it appears to be serving you well, and it has a ton of district-wide space in the basement, which was one of the smartest things that you ever did because you've got, you know, huge amount of storage space right in, the, in your biggest building, uh, for very, very little money. Uh, you know, the, co the cost of Scarborough High School now is like, you know, it's lunch money compared to schools that are being budgeted uh, by the Department of Ed at this point. So uh, that, I think that worked out very well for you financially. In terms of capital improvement plans, we've done all this inventory. What we haven't done yet is we haven't sat down with Todd, and this will take, you know, multiple meetings over, over the summer uh, to look at all the things that we found uh, identify things that, that should be corrected, prioritize them, you know, absolutely necessary, you know, good to do when you, when you can and not important, you know, things like that, and create a, 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 a system of values that the board can use to say, okay, this should be a priority because it, it has these features which need correcting. So basically it's taking all this information that, that we've gathered that Todd has had already with his VFA database and trying to organize it in a way that um, can, can be used going into the future. And the big key to that is that you have to spend time every year continuing to update those things in order to keep that plan uh, uh, viable and flexible and, and, and meaningful to you. So we, when we first interviewed for this job, we said we would come back a year after the, the study for free and just sit down and see what's working, what's not working as a, compared to what was said. And, and we'll do the you know we'll do the same thing with Todd. I mean I think it's just just important. And I'm and I'm looking forward to trying to working with Todd to try to figure out a, a format that we can use that can, is easily understood and easily updated um, without the sort of vast unnecessary complexity that the VFA uh, database and that the state used to sponsor uh, uh, has has been in the past. So I, I think that that'll be a real that'll be a fun thing to do. Um, and then the, the last thing that we were asked to do on the bottom of page uh, seven was uh, identify potential CIP funding sources, uh, you know, things beyond your annual capital budget or your emergency fund, et cetera, et cetera. So one obvious one is the state's revolving renovation fund. Um, I, I just contacted the state and asked them when their next round of applications would be. And normally they take applications in September. They said they haven't decided yet if they're going to do another round this September or, or perhaps wait until the spring. Um, but when they do, the, the primary criteria uh, down at the, the last sentence of that first paragraph is uh, th they look to fund health, safety, and, com and compliance issues, including roof structural upgrades, improvements to indoor air quality, compliance with ADA, hazardous material abatement and removal, and other health safety and compliance issues. They, they have another category for things like, you know, more classroom space, but they haven't funded that in, in, in years. But uh, we, we've been successful in other school departments uh, putting together applications for that, and the good news is that all of this stuff that you've commissioned is what you need to make those applications, because it's full of technical, technical data, technical requirements. Um, do you see particular places where we would be competitive with this? Um, oh yeah, I, th I think I think you know all the the primary schools have ADA issues. They have uh, the roof structures are pretty light. I mean, most of them are wood framed. Um, you know, improvements to indoor air quality. I, I think you could you could argue that if if uh, you've got uh, if the building is ventilating itself in a, in a way that it shouldn't with, you know, air flowing in and out of it, you're spending a lot of money uh, for heating and cooling and you're also not, not, you know, creating good indoor air quality because what you want to do is you want to seal that building up 
and then run all the air that's coming into the building through your system to filter it and get it nice and clean, send it out to the classroom, <coughs> you filter it again, you, you, you exhaust uh, the uh, certain percentage of that and replace it with fresh air and the cycle just goes on and on, you know, 24 hours a day. So uh, you, you've been very, very good at uh, removing a hazardous material. I think as a district, you're, you're pretty much done now. That, that's, that's, an amazing, oops, that's an amazing accomplishment. Um, so yeah, I, and I think it's, it's always worth applying uh, because you never know who else is going to apply and, and, and what the competition for funding would be. And Efficiency Maine used to be a really reliable source for uh, uh, pretty good amounts of money. Uh, I, you got $100,000, $125,000 for the Wentworth School uh, to, to help uh, offset the cost of high energy systems, lighting, electrical motors, things like that. Um, they, have, they have two programs. The lighting uh, program uh, was so successful that they've just run out of money. And uh, they've been, in the past five or six months, they've been in the process of figuring out when they're going to replenish that fund and then accept applications again. I just heard yesterday, in fact, that they may uh, start accepting applications again this summer. So lighting upgrades, I, I, again, I, I can't remember exactly the, the condition of all the, uh, the, the lighting in, say, the primary schools and the middle school, but changing from fluorescent to LEDs is a classic main efficiency main project which which you know in theory you would be uh, 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 would be available to you they also have a, a, a program for heating plant upgrades and that's something to think about for your primary schools because those those boilers for the most part are, are old um, they, they're old technology uh, so if you could get some money to to, uh, <coughs> to offset that that would also be a, a terrific uh, thing to do so uh, between Todd and I will track uh, efficiency main to find out when they're uh, you know, officially saying okay now we're going to accept applications again uh, but that's that's pretty good uh, pretty good free money the money you get from the revolving renovation fund is a combination of, of outright grants and interest-free loans so even an interest-free loan is a substantial savings to the to the school district especially when you think that by making these energy efficiency upgrades you're going to save money as well in the future, so you're getting savings you know, on, on two levels. So we'll aggressively pursue that with Todd for, well, forever. <laughs> we'll just keep going. And if anything else uh, pops up on the market in terms of other funding sources, then we certainly would, would go after those as well. So that's, the, the last seven pages are just the sort of core data from the population projections for you to look at uh, uh, for your reading pleasure uh, in the future. There's a lot of information there, but it is you know, the, the, two, the, the, the two prime takeaways that your population overall is, is rising, but pretty steady, but the primary schools are getting 25% you know, increase in 10 years. That's a lot of, a lot of kids. So <coughs> you may be having to think in a few years about how that's going to be handled in terms of space and, and parking and uh, common spaces and all that kind of stuff with your with your principals because it will feel like Dan, has anybody tried to construct a new envelope around the building? I'm sure somebody has. Uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of the innovation that's being done is being done in Europe, and uh, I have seen projects where they they created a <clears throat> a skin of the building outside of the existing skin. It's probably not inexpensive. In other words, it's it, you know there we can we can model what the payback might be. But there are uh, there are systems out there. And I, but I think for the primary schools, the first thing would be to tighten up those building envelopes to improve your mechanical system so they're operating very efficiently. You know, close up the holes, um, add insulation every place that you can. Uh, to make it better. I mean, there were, we went around, because and, and, it was done in the wintertime, we went around and we put our hands around the windows, and there are lots of windows in places where you could feel cold air coming through, which just means that the sealant that was around those windows when they were originally installed, you know, many years ago, has gotten dried and cracked. And so, again, all, this is all normal kind of stuff, but again, it shows up in your dollar per square foot operations cost. As, as something pretty clear, and I think that that's low-hanging fruit. You know, I think that that's pretty good bang for the buck. Those kinds of projects. Mm -hmm. yes. Anyone? Uh, quick question on these charts um, with the population trends. 
Which one should we be looking at here? <laughs> well, that's a really, really good question. Um, again, the best fit model is the traditional model that planning decisions has used. And when you look at the best fit model uh, that was done in 2010 and the one now, it's tracking, they're tracking pretty close. Uh, but the, uh, the housing impact model shows uh, quite, a, quite a change and I, I think that that's probably the number you should be using and thinking about because it's, it's more conservative. It, 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 it paints a, 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 probably the wrong word, worst case scenario in terms of, of dealing with additional kids and as long as Scarborough is still um, uh, issuing building permits and, 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 and people are moving in, you know, you can you can bet that the the, kid, the number of kids there will increase, and you have a great reputation. You know, this is, this district has. I, I just hired a an architect from from California who has moved here and is looking for a place to live, and she's looking one place she's looking is Scarborough because you know even before I talked to her, has heard that you have a great school system and there's just a lot of good things here. So I think that's going to increase. Because when I look at this best fit model, I mean, there the projection. He's already sort of we met it. gone by. Yes. That <laughs> <laughs> we met it, yes. 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 Correct. Okay. Um, so we, we did recognize that when we were having our conversations over the last, say, month or so, or month or two. Um, and just another side note to that piece is that recently there was an article in the newspaper. Um, the Eastern Village, Carrie Anderson's, originally when he had that planned development, he was planning on having more um, single-family homes. Uh, it appears now that he plans on doubling his number of units next year, but instead of selling them as condominiums, he's going to rent them. Right. So that could mean <coughs> that if a family says, hey, I can't afford to buy that condo, but I can rent it, hmm. we could see another influx of kids like right. you know, the Oaks and other places that are yeah. Rent, um, rent and what's Lady area. Farm? 140 or something? You know what? I'm not sure how many. 90 or so. 90 or so. Yeah. so, so um, you know, yeah. that's yeah. a lot of houses they're, over there, and you're talking mm -hmm. single-family homes that are, you know, three-plus bedrooms. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, those bedrooms aren't all filled up by the adults that live in the house. Right. So, um, you know, that's another side note. So, I think what we've planned on doing is kind of keeping track over the next month when uh, Mrs. Sizemore does the know, turn into the state and kind of compare where we are to see mm -hmm. and yeah. keep having these conversations so that this isn't just something that we did to put on a shelf, right. but we need to keep re keep yeah. reviewing this and keep, you know, on it because mm -hmm. things can change like that for us because of decisions that get made in the planning department or right. a builder buys that piece of land that's over there or, you know, who knows what's going to happen out on Scarborough Downs. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. yeah it, it probably would make sense to maybe every two or three years ask planning decisions to look at the housing impact numbers again, maybe not the whole study, but mm -hmm. meet again with Dan Bacon and just look at um, construction that's happened since the last time they did their study and what's, what's on the boards and what's in before the planning board uh, to keep, keep track of this. I think you'd probably do that for a pretty small amount of money and uh, just keep keep monitoring these. Again, in the, in the primary schools, it's going to drop to 595 or thereabouts, 575 in 2017, and then it's just going to go up like that if, if that if that proves to be true. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and what happens then, of course, is that for the most part, that bubble of kids, you know, then starts moving its way down through the rest of your schools. You can kind of track that um, in, in, the, in the numbers that, that I've uh, given you. And what will be interesting to see is how many of those kids that start in, the, in that K-2 bubble stay in Scarborough and keep going through your schools and how many of them leave to, to do whatever and how, how many new people come in. So, um, again, you've got capacity. You've got a, a nice building stock in general. Um, but but this is an this is an unusual situation in, in Maine. Most of the planning decision reports that we get in other districts is, you know, either slightly down or significantly down. Uh, very rarely do we see anything that says growth. And, and we're actually currently exceeding the housing start model. Yes. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Right. With over 3,040 kids at last count. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Dan, I really appreciate that you also met with Dan Bacon because <coughs> when when I met with you over a year ago, we were like looking at something totally different. Totally so, different. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. A year later, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the latest plan decision study was really just amazing. pretty amazing. But again, you, now you have the data. Again, you, you're, you've always been very good at analyzing, studying, making decisions based on data. So you have, you have data now to work with. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, Dan, yeah, for you. coming out. Todd, I'm sure, looks forward to working diligently <laughs> with you, as does, I'm sure, Kate. And I look forward to talking with you soon again. Yeah, probably in the fall. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you Dan. Pleasure to see you again. Yeah, you too. Wow. 8.0, a motion to adjourn. Do we have one? Already? Oh, we have a little ceremony? Mm -hmm. We want to talk? Oh. Yes. All right. Again, is this a road? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we should <laughs> say, right? <laughs> we <laughs> can we the last <laughs> meeting, so this meeting, no. Yeah, I, I mean, can we <laughs> say on record how much we yeah, appreciate yeah. Yeah. the support of the community yeah. in passing, passing the budget, the budget yeah. and yeah. supporting the budget committee who created a budget that was passable on the first vote? and that it was one that engendered confidence in the community. And mm -hmm. I hope that other people did a little happy dance that night. I did, and it's just, it was such a wonderful, wonderful and very different process compared to last year. And I think that speaks highly of the committee, and I think it speaks highly of the community, and hooray, right? Hooray. Yeah. Hooray. Mm -hmm. hooray. It's hooray. great. Yeah. Kelly? I was just gonna say, I think it's a great note to Say goodbye to one superintendent and bring somebody on without yeah. turmoil and angst yeah. that we're usually feeling at this time of the year. So it's great. Okay. Budget in place. And I'd like to say I don't ever like to say goodbye. So oh, we hope yeah. that we'll see you in the future and hopefully you'll come by and visit us and when you're back in town and Make sure you tweet us. And yes. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. You're going to tweet now. You're going to have a new weekend. You're going to have a new weekend. I don't know. I don't know. Oh. We'd like to see your Facebook yeah. page from there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I have these aspirations to learn how to say goodbye in Mandarin, and I never... Can you teach us now? <laughs> uh, how to say goodbye. Um, it is... Uh, I'll talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs> see you later. Pretty, <laughs> you're putting me up. She doesn't take the class. Yeah. Sai Jin. So good, that's goodbye. Sai Jin. It's goodbye. It's goodbye. Oh, we don't want to say goodbye. Yeah, that's what I know. We're going to working on it. Listen, he has a PhD. He can say more than that. Six, I think. Lesson number six. Well, thank you. We have finally all said this about that. Yeah. Well, thank you. You have. It's been my pleasure, really. You have set a. Yeah. Large footprint for the next superintendent to follow. And, uh, I thank you for that, and our community thanks you for that. And we wish you well. Thanks. China is lucky. China is lucky. China 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 yeah. Maybe. That's a big place. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the entire country is going to be in Disneyland. That's what I said. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to work with this board, certainly, and um, uh, I appreciate the support that you have given to me, that you've given to my team, um, that you've given to um, the, the, the staff here. Um, I have an extraordinary team, um, which I'm indebted to. They uh, followed me down dark alleys. They had no idea where we were going sometimes. Um, they did <laughs> <laughs> and, but they were trusting and, um, and they've done an extraordinary job. Faculty and staff as well, we haven't always been as coherent um, because we've been trying to move five things at the same time and, uh, and we've, uh, you know, we've, we've created a little confusion for them but they've stuck with us and they've done extraordinary uh, work. So it's been a, a great pleasure. I've, I feel very proud um, leaving this district to a new superintendent. I am very excited about your new superintendent. 
Um, I think that she will do a great job um, because she has a great team and a great board and a community that is now stepping up and really supporting the schools, which is, which is um, absolutely critical and certainly not to be taken for granted right. with, one, right. w with one vote. No um, right. But uh, so the, the work goes on, uh, but I think that there's been a lot of uh, good, good, solid foundation built. And um, like I said, I think myself and the team uh, as well is very, very proud of the work that we've done. So we got <laughs>